The Hidden Gospel by David W. Dyer, the audiobook. This book is published by A Grain of Wheat Ministries. Unless otherwise indicated, all quotations from the New Testament are from the Father's Life Version. The Old Testament quotations are from the New King James Version. To receive copies of this book without cost, or to read this book and other books and pamphlets online, go to www.agrainofwheat.com. That's agrainofwheat.com. And now for Chapter 5, Transformation. Written by David Dyer. Read by Wayne O'Connor. Chapter 5, Transformation. One of the many benefits of receiving God's life in our spirit is that we now can be being transformed. This is something which all believers need to be experiencing. Biblically, this is an ongoing, lifelong process. It is a privilege which we can and, in fact, must enjoy so that we can fully take advantage of all that Christ did for us. The meaning of transformation is that we become something different than we were originally. We are changed into a new kind of person. The word transformation in Greek is metamorpho, from which we get our word metamorphos. This is the radical change which a butterfly or moth caterpillar experiences as they pass through life. Initially, after hatching from their eggs, these worms crawl along on the ground or on plants. They are confined to the earth, but after a while they spin a cocoon or secrete their chrysalis around themselves. They then stay inside these coffin-like containers for some time, seemingly dormant. In fact, it seems as if they have died. There is no movement or sign of life, yet a significant change is happening there in the dark. Then, at the right moment, this shell begins to break open. When they finally emerge from this death chamber, they are new creatures. Instead of being somewhat ugly, earthbound worms, they have become beautiful creatures of the heavens. They have been transformed or metamorphosed. This is a very accurate biblical word to describe the process of how we too can be changed. Transformation is also something which we need to experience. It is part of the wonderful salvation which Jesus purchased for us by his blood. This is accomplished by our entering into the experience of the death and resurrection of Christ. This process slowly changes us from what we are, natural human beings who are confined to this earth, into glorious heavenly beings. Although this glory is hidden for now, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and will only be revealed at the coming of Jesus Christ, it is something very real. We read in Colossians, For you died and are dying, Together with the Anointed One, yet God's light, Zoe, within you, is kept hidden for now in God, together with the Anointed One. But when the Anointed One, who is that life in us, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in that glory, Colossians 3, 3 and 4. This is a process, something which should be occurring every day. We read, and don't be conformed to the patterns of this age, but be being transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you can discern what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. Also we are encouraged, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with our faces unveiled, through seeing and then reflecting the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, Second Corinthians three seventeen and eighteen. This is truly a wonderful message. It is really good news. 
we earthly human beings can experience a wonderful change. We can be transformed into the image of God. Wow! What a thought! It seems that Jesus really does have a wonderful plan for us. He wants to change us into his own glorious image. If you are curious about what this might look like, you can read the first part of the book of Revelation. There Jesus is described in his glorified state, Revelation 1, 13-16. Here we see him in shining garments, with his whole being radiating unbelievable light. The shining is a result of the tremendous eternal unlimited power and virtue which are filling him. When John saw this sight, he fell down at Jesus' feet as if he were dead. Now this is the same John who leaned on Jesus' chest at supper, John 13, 23. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved, John 20, verse 2. So he was very familiar with Jesus. Yet, when he saw him in his glorified condition, his humanity could not hold up under the power and glory which emanated from him, so he collapsed in front of him. This, my dear brothers and sisters, is glory. The glory to which we are called is not a place. It is a state of being. To be glorified means to be full of and radiating forth God's own power and splendor. This is what Jesus is calling us to. His intention is to change us so radically, so thoroughly, that when he returns, we will be like he is right now. This is what is called transformation. We really must be experiencing this change today, so that tomorrow it can be seen in us. Jesus teaches us. Then the righteous will shine brightly like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Matthew 13, 43. Yet somehow this gospel has been mostly hidden. It seems to have been changed. Most Christians think of glory as a place, a destination to which they will go, perhaps somewhat similar to a celestial Disney world or Muslim paradise. Instead of a message about our destiny being changed into the image of Christ, we have heard a message about a destination somewhere where we might go. The gospel has been diluted and impoverished through misunderstanding of what God is calling us to. Perhaps since many Christians have so little experience of changes actually happening in their lives, their faith is largely imagination. Therefore, a storybook, Gloryland, full of physical and soulish pleasures, combines with what they picture in their mind. But let me assure you that when you are glorified with the glory of Christ, where you are will not make any difference to you. When you are sharing in the life, nature, power, and glory of God, destinations will be insignificant. The true gospel is not about where we will go, but about who we will be. It is not a message of a glorious destination, but of a glorious state of being, to which we are called, and for which we must be preparing. It is not a gospel about some glory land, but about being glorified. Physical Rewards as we have seen, having an accurate translation of the scriptures is an important thing. How words are rendered can have an astounding influence on how Christians understand the message of Jesus. For example, let us look at the translation of just one word of only one verse of the New Testament, which has powerfully influenced millions of believers around the world, to believe in the fairy tale gospel about which we have been speaking. Countless English speaking missionaries have encircled the globe in the past few centuries. In no way would I wish to disparage or denigrate the value of their work. Yet many of them carried with them the almost universally popular translation of the Bible called the King James Version or the Authorized Version. This translation was made at the directive of King James of England, who authorized it. He was at the same time king and the spiritual head of the Anglican Church. This version was completed and first published in the year 1611. 
In this version, we find an interesting word. It is the word mansions. We read, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. John 14.2, King James Version. It is unbelievable how much effect this one word has had on generations of Christians. Many places where these missionaries went were at that time, or still are, poor countries. Partly for this reason, this verse led countless believers to hope for a mansion and other riches when they get to heaven. This is what I would call the destination-centered or physical rewards gospel. I remember preaching to a large congregation in a very poor country more than 20 years ago. I was trying to explain our true rewards which we have in Christ. I said something like this, look, if having a large house with three cars in the garage is heaven, then the United States is heaven. I was shocked to see virtually the entire group nodding their heads in agreement with me. But when we take a closer look at the scriptures, we find that there will be no mansions. That's right. No one will ever get a mansion. They don't exist and never will exist. The Greek word here means dwelling places. It does not mean palace or mansion. Paul, our beloved brother, explains to us just what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was speaking of our new glorified bodies, not mansions. Jesus is right now preparing new heavenly bodies for us to live in. Paul said, for we know that if our earthly tent dwelling is destroyed, our physical body, that is, we have a building from God, an eternal house in the heavens, which is not made by human hands, that is, our glorified body. For we truly groan for this, greatly desiring to put on as a garment our habitation, which is coming from heaven, so that, being so clothed, we will not be found naked." For truly we who are in this earthly tent groan, being burdened, not simply wanting to put something off, but to put on our immortal body, so that which is mortal might be swaddled up by the eternal life of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4. Oh, the songs which have been written and the hymns which have been sung about these mansions which are not scriptural, true, or real. Countless Christians for many generations have been misled by this one mistranslated word. With this inaccurate translation as a basis, many have gone on to believe in streets of gold, filled with luxury cars, all sorts of physical and soulish pleasures, riches such as piles of gold, etc. Yet all this is just a fairy tale a fable that has nothing to do with the genuine gospel. Therefore, it cannot truly inspire Christians to seek what God has for them in the future. Furthermore, it has no genuine spiritual power to secure a believer's heart in the hour of temptation. How much damage has been done by the erroneous translation of just one word? This error is so pervasive and pernicious that even though no modern translations, except the New King James Version, that I know of, now uh, use the word mansions, this notion still lives on. Even in countries which don't speak English and have never used this word mansions in any of their translations, believers still have heard about and are expecting to receive mansions. The effect that this one word has had on Christian thinking around the world is almost unbelievable. I would like to reassure you that you won't need a physical house or mansion when you are in the presence of the Lord. Since there will be no more night, Revelation 22.5, and no one will get tired, sleepy, or fatigued, there will be no need for bedrooms. Also, there will be no hunger or necessity to prepare food, so there will be no need for kitchens, 
This does not mean we will not eat or drink. Of course, there will also be no need for bathrooms. Furthermore, there are no walls inside the New Jerusalem. We read that it is completely transparent like crystal, Revelation 21, 11. There will be no need for privacy, a time alone, a need to get away from the others, etc. There will be no part secret, hidden, or dark. For all these reasons, no mansions will be wanted or needed. Also, there will be no piles of gold. There will be no need for it either. There will be no stores, nothing to buy, or even anything we might need. In fact, there are not even streets of gold, as many believe, since in the Greek text, this word is singular and therefore should be translated street or central square. What will our reward be? If, then, there are no mansions, no piles of gold, no expensive cars, and no earthly entertainments, what will our reward be? What do we have to look forward to if it is not these things? There is one principal reward which we will receive. It will be the same reward for everyone. This reward is God himself. God said to Abraham, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Genesis 15, 1. Are you disappointed by this? Does this seem inadequate or small? If so, then you have not begun to know who God is. He is everything. He is the creator of all that exists. He is all and all. He is so much more than we can even imagine that it is impossible even to speak about with human words. Our God is infinite and eternal. He is without limit, and he is willing to share himself with us as our reward. But even though everyone will get the same reward, it will be different for everyone. Not everyone will be able to enjoy this reward at the same level. This will be because of the differences in spiritual growth among Christians. You see, not all Christians grow to spiritual maturity. Not all press on to know the Lord in his fullness. For various reasons, not all take advantage of their time on this earth to grow up spiritually. Therefore, their capacity to enjoy and participate in the future joys of the Lord will be limited by their maturity. This fact is no different from how things are on this present earth. A baby cannot even feed itself or walk. A toddler cannot go outside of the house alone. A child cannot marry. There are many, many things younger people cannot do or be because of their immaturity. This same truth will apply to future spiritual things. Our capacity to enjoy God himself and all the future things he will newly make will be governed by our spiritual maturity which we attained while living here on earth. Please allow me to repeat this essential truth. Our capacity to experience and enjoy God himself and all that he will create in the future be determined by our spiritual maturity which we realize while here on earth. There will be no spiritual growth after the rapture or the grave. Today is the day for salvation, 2 Corinthians 6.2. Consequently, our loving of God, our giving ourselves to Him, our faith and obedience, our filling ourselves constantly with Him, will all result in our greater or lesser reward, which will be our enjoyment of He Himself. That same image. You may have wondered why 2 Corinthians 3.18 when speaking about our being changed in Jesus' image, uses the word that same image. What then does this word same mean? You see, Jesus is actually the image of someone else, his Father. The scriptures say that he, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15. And who being the radiance of his glory and the exact image of his essence, Hebrews 1.3. 2 Corinthians 4.3 and 4 
speaking about Jesus' glory, calls him the anointed one, who is the image of God. Therefore, the glory to which Jesus is calling us is even more special than we imagined. It is the glory of the Father himself. It is Jesus' intention. In fact, it is his fervent prayer that we enter into and obtain the glory of his Father. In the Gospel of John, while praying to his Father at the moment of greatest trial, Jesus said, And the glory which you have given me I have given to them, so that there would be a complete oneness to the degree that we are one, I in them and you in me. This is so that they would be perfected into our oneness in order that the world would know that you sent me and love them just as you loved me. John 17, 22 through 23. This is why we need to experience transformation. The rewards are beyond comprehension, yet they are real. As believers, this is our hope, the hope of being glorified with his glory. This requires that we be changed into his image today, the image of the invisible God. There will be no second chance. There is no transformation after death. The only thing which will be changed after we die or are raptured is our body. Our inner parts, our soul and spirit must be transformed today by the work of the Holy Spirit. If we neglect to take advantage of this almost unbelievable possibility and fill ourselves daily with all that Jesus is, we are the most foolish of all people. Hebrews 2.3 Conclusion Dear friends, what kind of a gospel has been preached? What have we been announcing to the world that is producing so little real fruit? Perhaps we need to prayerfully reconsider our message and seek the face of God until we have something genuine and powerful to say. We desperately need to experience something real and transforming in our own lives. We should be careful that what we are giving to others is really true and will bring some benefit to them. Only the truth sets people free, John 8, 32. Any other message can't and won't do the job. It is small wonder that the gospel which so many have been preaching has had so little effect. It now becomes apparent why the power of Jesus' message seems to have been so diminished. Much of his truth has been lost. The essence of his message has been diluted or missed, and other powerless human or earthly ideas have been substituted in its place. We have been robbed of much of the truth of the scriptures, so our message doesn't have the awesome power that it should have to change the human condition. May God have mercy upon us so that we could both know his salvation and its fullness ourselves and be his instruments in ministering his truth to the perishing world around us. This is the end of The Hidden Gospel, written by David W. Dyer. The audio version was read by Wayne O'Connor.